time. Yes, Please, please, my porcelain princess was popping. Oh, hello. Let's be energetic. <laughs> I can already tell we tired. Come on, girl. We can do it. We can do it. Please. Uh, bang, bang. I'm not tired. Let's crack a lack in. You're not tired? Mm -hmm. I'm always tired. I always have a mild fatigue, but no. I'm well. I'm well. Um, my child has been away from me for a week now. Oh, wow. Absent mother. Like, <laughs> you said what? An absent mother. It's, like, <laughs> it's been really, I recommend all mothers be away from their child for a week for the, oh, listen, right. that is, that's another thing. Co-parenting, listen, two-parent households, shout out to y'all. Y'all are doing as the Bible had intended. It is good and holy, but also those co-parented parents, when you get that weekend, some people getting a week and a half off by themselves. It's, it's not telling people to break up so they can have a break. I'm not child. saying break up, but I'm saying, <laughs> listen, some people with their kids all the time. Some people aren't. And I feel like a lot of the mothers that I know be like feeling rejuvenated. But these past, um, this past week has been really eye opening for me, I've been really like being with myself and going out by myself more often and trying to explore activities and things that like trying to figure out what I like outside of the obligation and the constant demand of work um, and being creative outside of the demand of being creative. And it's been really rejuvenating it's been very lovely it's been very um scary in a lot of ways but i enjoy it and now that jojo is going back to school girl i saw that meme that all the single moms got 8 a.m to 3 45 <laughs> from the daddy he was like shout out to all the single moms now free from all the guys fucking the single moms going eating the kids fucking gummies and drinking a juice boxes and shit um terrible no i feel like all right i feel like really prioritizing that and really figuring out at least once a week to like step away from obligation and go into an area of fun and play and discovery so it feels good yeah That's but nice. she's coming i really do miss her and i'm excited to see her and that also feels important like you need to miss you need to miss these kids mm -hmm. excited when they walk into the room you know what I mean? so shout out to take a break walk that kid <laughs> off at your grandma's house or somebody's house for a little bit two days so two days somebody house how are you that's interesting I, I i'm reading what i wrote and i'm like the exact opposite <laughs> I wrote, feeling overwhelmed, trying to make time for everything, working out, sleep, work, podcast, research. Social life doesn't really exist unless it is a special occasion. That is literally what I wrote down at, I think, two o'clock in the morning when I was updating this uh, outline. Sheila, I have been struggling. Work has been working. I've been working. Um... And I don't know. I I feel like a broken fucking record. I was going to say, it feels like something that you've been working through. Sometimes I'm really good at it and sometimes, sometimes. I'm not. I, I think it, yeah, I don't know. I, today was a day where I, I actually was off work. But, you know, when you're off work, you have to prepare to be off work. I was off work, actually, because I recorded with Mandy and Bridget again um, for See The Thing Is. Um, please check that episode out. It aired Friday of last week, and it's called Ho Plus Tep. <laughs> I believe that's the name of the episode. Oh, my God. That sounds and, uh, You can guess which one I was. <laughs> but um, I have to say that I was exhausted today. I went to sleep really late. And woke up and was like, all right, let me get myself together. And you have to, like, show up a certain way on their podcast because it's video. So I'm in a dress. 
Um, this is the first day that my blood is with me. So I just feel drained. And after that episode, I felt, I did feel rejuvenated. I think it was probably the best episode we've ever done together. Ooh. Um, we really cracked open all of us. Mandy went in and she literally, Mandy B, for those of you who know who is half of horrible decisions and half of see the thing is, literally said and and kind of like told me that I helped her get to this point where she recognizes that she doesn't know her value outside of work. And she was like crying, talking about it. And then she also recognized that she has made a living on one of her podcasts talking about the shame around some of her sexual experiences and using her trauma for entertainment purposes. And I was like, whoa. And I see this blossoming of her and I'm so fucking proud of her because Mandy is a sexual being. She's kinky. She, you know, like she is into some shit and she has every right to be, but some of it, from earlier on in her life where she had to use sex for survival, literally, mm -hmm. um, is really attached to a lot of trauma. And so she's, she's rebranding and redefining herself. Mm. And that's really painful. I have a lot of people in my life who judge her. Um, and I have to check them when they do it, if they do it. And, and I just think that everyone listening who knows her, or thinks they know her or who's doing doing a rebranding of themselves needs to understand that you have the right to say like that was me then this is me now amen i've changed and you better be doing that yeah and so i'm just really proud of her and then the episode you know we started off in that like those were our updates <laughs> And then it turned into, you know, the regular conversation. And when I tell you, we were cackling, like holding my stomach, laughing, and not to try to be funny and keep the energy up, but like literally it felt like community. And it was really a special moment. And it helped ground me into like, okay, this is why you're doing this work. Like this mm -hmm. is, you mm -hmm. know, like you're tired, you get it. You're Again, I'm not at the place where I can... I can financially give up the nine to five and sustain myself on my creative. So I'm in that in between space and I just have to stay on the trajectory and that's hard to do. <laughs> and then I, you know, came home and, and now I'm potting with you, which I'm tired, but I know for a fact, I never, I never regret a podcast with you. So here we are. We're here. I mean, there have been a couple episodes. I'm like, boo. <laughs> but, um, and I have to say, the last episode, is, what is it? Is, is capitalism ruining your sex life or some shit like that? Sex is being ruined by capitalism. That is a good-ass episode. Y'all better go listen to that shit and download it. Because it's it really like good. Boring. It's one of my top. I know, they were like, capitalism again? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Just because you put sex in the title doesn't mean I'm going to listen. <laughs> Fuck y'all and listen to the episode. It's excellent. But in other news, I saw a video of an Asian man at a, um, <laughs> at a, it looked like a New York game, a Yankees game maybe. And he had a hot dog and he put the straw, his straw through the hot dog to make like a canal through the hot dog. And then threw the straw on the ground, put the hot dog in his beer and use the hot dog as a straw. And I don't know what it says about me, but I wanted to do it. And so I was at the store today and looking at hot dogs thinking, wow. <laughs> I want to try this and see if it works. And it made me think of that like crate challenge. Internet. I know, but I just wanted to try it out. And I, and I thought like, wow, are you, are you being influenced or are you just like weird? <laughs> and I still want to do the crate challenge. I, it's like, I'm thinking to myself, like, what did these things say about you? Like, I see certain TikTok or, you know, I'm not on TikTok, but on these little things on Instagram, I'm like, yo, and they're dumb. I'm like, I want to try that it's so bad. And they're reckless. So even while I'm tired, the I think that's kind of The hot dog is just strange. But I see people like doing it now and trying it out. You should do One it just for the content. Cool. 
No, see, I imagine it's cool, say. but it's just kind of tastes strange. Uh, we won't continue on this, but I do want to know what beverage of choice you will drink through the hot dog because I don't see you drinking a beer. What would it? No, be? I don't like beer. What would it be? Whoa, that's a really great. Can't be water. You need a flavor. What goes good with hot dogs? I think a good soda, a, a ginger ale. Oh, I would go a Coke. No Coke. Coke. No. I Something hope you're not a go- nice ginger you don't ale. Like Coke? They don't pay for this, so ginger ale is not a brand. Coke is. <laughs> not cola. Well, cola. See? A nice cola. A cola. <laughs> okay. Um. In other news. I tried to be in a. I tried to be a hot girl. Mm. Shout out to my Nigerians, my favorite people in the world. Some of them, uh, Chi, uh, Dio, and Nas, my PVO guys, my positive vibes only guys. They threw their annual New York City party. I went with Mandy, of course, and Kirby Singer, who we had on. Kirby is in the fold. Kirby's in the fold. And um, y'all, I, they were just, I, it was amazing to see them work. And I just was like, yo, I'm not a fucking hot girl. I'm not. I had my Birkenstocks on within two minutes of being in that venue. I had a grandma bag with me full of their shoes. Poor, first of all, poor Kirby didn't even have any shoes. And then I was looking around and thought, I don't know none of this music. I'm here for my people. I'm here to support but man, I wish that they were playing Roberta Fleck. No, I just was like, I don't know any of them. Not this. Roberta Fleck. None of it. To hear. No, seriously, Chauncey. It made me think like we have we're to old. throw a party. Or oh, That's not what I thought. I, oh, sorry. When I was thinking about Curl Days, remember the party we threw? And it was the 90s hip hop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. R&B vibe, mm-hmm. like 90s and the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. I really think that we should do that again for all of the old souls in the house. Let's go back to the 80s. I you can't even... fucking dance to this you ruggy, can't. dark, this scary is... music. It's scary. <laughs> and they just all standing around doing this. And I'm like, you can't That's not grind dancing. on no fucking body to that. Can't, couldn't give nobody a Wally. Not a what? single Wally was I'm given. You. It's frustrating. I was frustrated. But um, it was still a good time, and and it's so much fun to be in a group in a room full of people who they really are there to just okay. have fun. Mm-hmm. They're there to look pretty, to have fun, to hug up on each other, love up on each other. It really is an event where no, there's no beef, there's no nothing. Everybody's just like excited to see what people are traveling to come to this party. Ooh, that's it was right. Like, plane tickets. Somebody showed up in a motherfucking party bus. I said, my oh. God, not a party bus. <laughs> they promote was... promoters. They ever done that in Miami yet? They had a PBO in Miami? They need to. If they don't, they need to. But all I know is I was like, let me borrow a dollar because y'all rich. Because this is ridiculous. But shout out to them. I'm really proud of them. And yeah, I, I had a couple drinks and I couldn't recover. I, I was dead for two days struggling. And then we went to Dumbo House, which that's a whole other thing, which do you know what that is? Girl, no, it's a Disney movie for all I know. (laughs) No, it's a fucking. So these houses are all over the country and they're exclusive houses where you have to pay a membership fee in order to be able to access them countrywide but sometimes you you can have a membership to only one house and so this is where the upper echelon of all the people go and they mingle and canoodle and you still got to go and pay for overpriced drinks overpriced food overpriced overpriced but basically the thought is well when you go you're going to be surrounded by who you went we went with mandy girl me ain't got no fucking um membership to that kirby does so you can get people in if you have a membership so we went and it was just it was beautiful it's a beautiful space dry but i couldn't no it wasn't dry it wasn't it was a beautiful space with people who felt really networky but also like cool like uh everybody seemed like they were enterprising but everybody seemed like they were trying that they were very aware that they were at dumbo house and that they were fancy And you know me, that ain't me. Um, But it was interesting to be in there and to 
feel like the brokest person in there. I don't know what to do. I was just like, ugh. Like, I'm going to buy There's these probably products. a lot of broke people in there. Dude, I was hoping. Yes, I was oh, hoping. Definitely. But apparently, like, they take your phones. Like, you can't have phones out in certain areas. So celebrities will go there and things like that. So whatever. I mean, I get it. You live in the dream, girl. Am I? I really I not. I went to a Barnes and Noble by myself, and I was like, <laughs> "Wow, this is living." And bitch, you out girl, here that was shoulders. That was one night, and then I was dead. But I would. That's the thing about me. It's like even while I was there, I kept thinking to myself, "It would be so nice to play spades. Like it would be so nice to just like chill." And yeah, there were like these men there that looked like they were in Tyler Perry sitcoms. They were very handsome but knew it couldn't Ridiculous. it was just untrustworthy yeah, it was just untrustworthy their energy mm-hmm. was very like okay mm-hmm. good talk so i wasn't impressed but it was beautiful if i could afford it and go and work from there every day and just enjoy the view oh was that I would the vibe it. you can go, it's like a clubhouse kind of like it's a membership a club. yeah, okay. exactly i thought it was just like a night type. there's a pool that, no it's not a it's not a lounge it it turns into that at night but it's a clubhouse it's for like adult networking and and they have events there and yeah anyway whatever child i'm tired if you're gonna live i'm proud if you're gonna live in new york you better live in the fuck new york or else That's what's the, the whole new york the new york and the uh like it's a part of it the range it's like you have range in it you know mm-hmm. what i mean yeah it's true it by you. but i um I don't know. I was thinking about like an around the way house where like it was like duality is a thing. You could have like hot dogs as straws straws. and shit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And playing. Does that uh, feel like a vibe? Yeah, but and you can't play music past 2005. Some dusty niggas. Untrustworthy still, but dusty or a little less intimidating. (laughs) (laughs) RC balls in the mix. Absolutely, artsy balls. Like I, I'm, I'm Red caps. if we could curate a space, it would I was be thinking cute. about that. Yeah, It'd be like, so what cute. kind of space would we curate, and who would come? It would be a sight to see. But anyway, shout out to Dumbo House. I would never pay four thousand dollars a year to join, but shout out to all the people that can afford that. Very Again, good for you. Just got our nice. sponsorship yank too, like that light skin, interesting girl. Up no, in I can't. Huh? I can't afford it. If they want to give me a free one, listen, I'd be we will more talk than well happy. upon it. I wasn't hating on it. It's a, again, I would I just said I would go. It's a beautiful mm-hmm. space. But I ain't I'm not I need Invisalign apparently, so I can't. My teeth are shifting. I got shit other shit to pay for. They Girl, not being old and needing Invisalign now. We can't Child, be regressing in the ways of the aesthetics now. <laughs> it's it's all regressing over here, all right? <laughs> it's tricky. It's getting trickier by the minute. But anyway, Shanti, I'm really excited. You have a guest. We have a guest, but you found this incredible young woman for our hot shit. So let's get into that. And so we are on to our hot shit segment. And tonight is a special night. We actually have a manifestation of hot shit, somebody that is creating and generating really dope things and sharing it with all of us items that many of you have probably seen and lusted after and hopefully worn we have ariel of home by ariel with us tonight she is a jewelry designer clothing designer and now a shoe designer as i just learned yeah (laughs) so come through with the come through um we you and i have personal history together as we were just kind of like coming up in this wild time of of being a creative entrepreneur um, back in the day in Philly, which we share our hometown, all three of us. Um, I used to have these pop-up events and bring a bunch of vendors together and I would constantly like email and tap on your shoulder and ask you to come and, and it was, it's been a wild Yes, yeah. it's been a really wild ride, yeah. but as I said yesterday, super, 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 super proud of seeing how your business and your work is blossoming and just being shared with the world. And by the world, I mean on the ears of Beyonce, on the ears of 
Kelly Rowland on the ears and necks of so many style icons, Tracy Ellis Ross, Child was on Blue Ivy, Mary J. Blige, India <laughs> Ivory, um, most notably, I think, which really rocked people even before Beyonce was India Moore when she wore your long frame um, earrings. And that was really like a significant moment. So just watching your glow up has been really beautiful. And I wanted to, to share it um, with our guests and inspire some folks because I, I actually know of some jewelry makers that are listeners um, that would just be really excited to hear about your journey yes, and thank you thank you for joining us thank you i'm so happy to be here i've been a fan for a long time like you said we've been back and forth in the email and to be finally face to face with you guys through the screen i'm really excited to talk to y'all. <laughs> i think um what's really amazing is that i mean just from what i know of you personally you're not necessarily in like this white knuckle grind mode you feel just like the jewelry that you have by the way if you are on our patreon yeah. you will see that all of us are rocking some of your pieces yeah. um the whimsy of them the just the magic just like the the shock in so many ways of like girl you have a lit like candle on your ear your designs <laughs> are wild and I think that just kind of speaks of how you've been um, interfacing with, with your with your craft. So if you could just share with folks how you started on your jewelry designing yeah. journey. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm definitely not white knuckling it. I'm feeling my way through. I like, as we've discussed before, we I uh, started just on a whim, really just making it to music and dancing and I was at Howard University, which is known to be a fashion campus. So as soon as I gave out the earrings to, I had like five earrings I created the first day just for some friends on my downtime. And the next day there were a tremendous amount of requests for the pieces. And so my brand started out of a request and out of being in a situation where there was a lot of love for black fashion and helping Black people, you know, Chocolate City, D.C., Howard University. So it was, you know, it, it was divine. Um, like most of the brand things that have been happening, they've all been like just happening, I would say, sporadically, whimsically, without a plan, just flowing my way through. So <laughs> it's a journey. When did you decide... To take it seriously, when did you decide that, like, all right, this is my hobby, people really like it, but now, like, I'm making money, how can I sustain this as a business? What was the moment? Um, I believe the moment that I really, truly took it seriously within myself was in 2019 when the Going Back Home collection came out because it was born out of my like a true healing in the moment being traveling across the country to be home with my godmother who was ill and who passed suddenly mm -hmm. I stayed there and and she she's been magical on earth so in her passing and in our grieving she showed up in so many ways like through nature through birds through butterflies through our grass popping with purple flowers everywhere purple ribbons coming in the and um and the garden and wrapping itself around the fence. Purple is her color. Mm -hmm. And and everywhere I was reminded, like, that she hasn't left. Mm -hmm. And I had felt like my foundation shake when she left because she was everything to me. So with all of her reminders, it became a process of me reminding myself. And as an artist, it goes into my artwork. And that's where some of the most, important pieces came and that's when I realized how deep fashion is and that it's never been surfaced for mm -hmm. us as people of color. Mm -hmm. It's always had deep meaning and is connected to healing and celebration. So that <laughs> 2019 after doing it for like nine years is when I actually was like, this is this is what I want to do. <laughs> this is my platform. Yeah. And so during that time I feel like I mean two thousand and nineteen to two thousand 2020 was like no joke for everybody 
but it feels like 2020 for black businesses and for your business in particular, again, with the, I don't know when the India more, um, yeah, that was like 2018. Oh, child. Okay. Well, th that yeah, was, yeah. wow. Even with the India more thing, you were still like, oh, this is nice. That was cool. But 2019. It was 2019, I'm wrong. Because the picture frame earrings were a part of the Going Back Home collection. I remember them, yeah. And I put my godmother. And I put all of the faces of her children and her and them. And then India Moore, Silas, Ian, um, Ian um, hit me up and told me about the mission. So it was 2019 when it happened. And so then that's when you were like, all right, yeah. this is going to become, yeah. all right, this, this is business now. I'm diving. I have something to say. I don't even think business. That's when I took it seriously. Me, mm. I'm like, my business is personal to me. It's like, mm. if I don't feel it, if I don't feel like it's going to change the world in my way, like, you know, how we have to give to the world before we leave, or I feel that way, then I don't want to take it seriously, seriously. And now that's when I felt like, oh, no, this is connected to me on a deep level, and I can, and I can speak as broadly and as intimately as I want to. And that's when I took it seriously. So Okay, yeah. and that's when the, the business is coming out of it. And so then twenty twenty yeah. comes and everybody's rocked. The world rocked. Um black businesses got a lot, a lot of love. And I don't know if it happened yeah. on twenty twenty. Well but all I know is that Black Parade came out in the during the holiday <laughs> yeah. season. And for me, because I had followed so many black businesses online for a long time, and for many folks, I like have relationships with these people to see so many folks that I love on that fucking website. Yeah. I was like, holy shit. And then oh, to see the website. Wait, what black website? Beyonce. Beyonce is Nicole oh. Parade? No. Black, she, but on Beyonce.com, she put Black Parade. So Black Parade was on Beyonce. Dark. Okay, right. as the market. Yeah. That yeah. was a curated yeah. market of Black businesses. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. shut people down. I don't know if you guys <laughs> shut us down. Shut us down. Mm -hmm. I just remember being like, down. we ain't got no product left. Like, just, <laughs> did you have any sense of that you were going to be featured on that? So you could be like, all right, yeah, let me, let me make a couple. Oh. It just was a surprise no. to you as well. No. Everything was a, Beyonce is a surprise. Like everything was a surprise. Like so, what happened? I think like six months prior, her stylist um, hit me up for some pieces, and then Black Parade came out, which was a surprise to everyone. I believe. I don't know. Maybe other people knew. And I just was on the list. I was just on Beyonce's <laughs> list. <laughs> I was on the list, like and then I kind of put it together. Like, oh, they remembered me. From when they borrowed from me six months ago, and mind you, I didn't know Black Black is King was coming out either. I just knew Beyonce had a project, okay. <laughs> and then yeah. so it, I think Black is King came out after Black Parade. Okay, so it was like a double Beyonce. <laughs> and then your shit got oh. your shit got sold out. I just know everybody's website was just crashed because people were supporting like crazy. Oh, yeah. And I remember. Can I, Go ahead. Can I ask with the website with that happening? You make your pieces by hand, right? Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I'm wearing this and I'm like this. This. <laughs> oh, not. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So wait, but or at least then maybe you, now you fig yeah. may have the figured Macy's out. Pieces. Okay, yeah. a way to. The Macy's pieces are made by Macy. Got it. But so my pieces, yeah. mass produce them, but while when Beyonce was like, yo, 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 this is fire, y'all should buy it you were making all of your pieces by hand. So is that overwhelming? Like what's going through your head of like, holy shit, I have to yeah. figure out all these orders and then yeah. I have to figure out mm -hmm. how to replenish them because the demand is here and I need to rise to the occasion, to the moment. Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> is that exactly, I, um, I pee on myself. <laughs> I'm telling you like, exponentially grew from like the, the an, a day's order would be something I couldn't fulfill. It would take me like a long time to fulfill. And so there came a point where I was like, eh, shutting this down. Mm -hmm. Like I can't, 
I can't do this. And even when I shut it down, I gave people a warning. And then that was worse. I shouldn't have warned people because then more orders came in. And then I shut it down around August 2020. I don't think I was done shipping orders out into the next year. Wow. And I, I took a break, went to Harlem. I was like, I'm going to enjoy my space. You still and, like, my continue to do it by yourself. My sister came to help me. I had a couple friends that came to help me, but I was not prepared for the growth like that. And I tried to teach people how to do it. I think it's easy, but you know, no. you always think your art is easy. <laughs> it's not. Um, so yeah, I was by myself and it was a struggle. Wow. And that's why y'all, a lot of people didn't see me um, for like a year after that. I was like, ah, I need to go take some time and think about what I want to do next. Talk and about girl, that a little bit, because yeah. I, girl, I saw some video, you were in a, all I saw was banana leaves, you had a sarong on, <laughs> your skin was dewy, you were just, yeah, you had a machete, co- coconuts, and I was like, wow, this <laughs> is my Beyonce dream. I was like, she made it to the other side, like, I don't know if you saw me with, like, if you truly saw me with a machete, but I definitely have video of my a machete and me getting uh, breadfruit from a No, it was, it was you. I was like, yes, <laughs> that's what you do. I, I love the resistance yes. to going into overdrive. Can you just talk about what, how you yeah. had faith in, like, I'll be okay, even if, you know, I don't take yeah. advantage of this moment. That- that is not, I'm not, I wasn't like automatically like, oh, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be a short, I'm going to be so, like, I'm going to be all right. Um, it was kind of, it always reminds me of the Kanye line. He was like, don't leave while you're hot. That's how May screwed mm-hmm. up. And I'm like, oh no, a warning. But I was like, I have to, you know, and, and if my pieces, my pieces truly come from myself. So, and come from like an intimate experience, which means like people say, if you want to reach the masses, then then um pinpoint a finite detail like be specific like when we're broad we think oh we'll be broad we'll reach everybody but no you reach everybody by being true 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 and specific and so when i do that like the pieces are timeless it's not it's not a fad it's not like oh this is and got a little ear cuffs got a little chain belt belt. it's like these are pieces that like the pieces that i started 10 years ago are still thrown out to this day and so i had to have i had to have faith but also, I had a lot of dreams that reminded me of who I am and um, and and my support system that's always there. Something that I needed, like an, I needed to hear and see those messages because it was a time where, I, like, I I felt like I had to escape. It wasn't like, oh, I'll be fine. You know, I just felt like I had to. Mm. I was like, if I if I want to produce the next thing, I need to sit and be still and and actually know what's going on with me so I can actually, you know, breathe a piece. I can't, you know, I'm, I'm not a machine. So it can be so generative, yeah. Like, otherwise, yeah. it's, yeah, you can't give if your cup is empty, yeah. whatever they be saying on the self-care <laughs> memes. You irritating, <laughs> <it>, yo. <Girl. laughs> Kool-Aid cup and a glass of wine now got to be full of the things. <laughs> And that reminds me of my ne- one of my next pieces. I want to give you a sneak peek from Macy's. It's actually the cup running over. Yes. So our cups are always spilling over water. Bountiful. I love that. And that's what it is. It reminds that's me of the um, Ace of Cups in the in the um. It's the Ace yeah, of Cups. Yeah, Ace of Cups in it the tarot. Um. Yep. Well, let's talk yep. about that for people that don't know that journey. Okay, on Black Parade. Then Black is King comes out, and that's when I was really hyped because I was like, I know that necklace that Blue Ivy has on. So then your <laughs> stuff, then I guess those are the pieces that they asked for. You're finally like, oh, are they ever going to debut it? And then it comes out in Black is King. Yeah. They asked for so many pieces, and it was crazy because it happened the night before they needed yeah. them and in a different city than they needed them in. So I'm like, booking a mega bus ticket to New York mm. City and I'm making the pieces at night and my soldering machine which is something I used to weld the metals together went out and then I had a backup one and that wasn't working and I was like not on the day of the day like what is happening and I just stayed up all night and eventually I, like, I would be able to weld here and there with patience and I got most of the pieces that they wanted and I just did my best and I gave it to them the next day 
and I didn't hear back from them. <laughs> For how long? No, it, until um, I think like five months passed, and I was like, oh, you know, usually you get your pieces returned. And I'm like, do I want my pieces returned to be out there? But I did check in. <laughs> I said, you know, asked about them, and they sent back everything but a few, and they told me why they didn't send back a few is because Beyonce wore them and they wanted to keep them, um, I guess, to archive them. And so wow. I was like, yes, I'm going to, something's happening. <laughs> I didn't know what, but something was happening. Wow. So Beyonce, Beyonce and her baby. Beyonce. So. And you can see on Black is King, yeah. she has on the cowrie earrings, similar to what Tracy Ellis Ross, the other god, um, had on in that iconic magazine and then blue has on the love necklace yeah and beyonce has a mama's mama's mm-hmm. mama's hoop, which is a, it's a, like a double hoop it's a black face with she's wearing double hoops in it yeah you'll be able to see it on my page <laughs> um yeah i actually was supposed to design for well i did send in some pieces for jay-z too and it didn't make it came back because um she said that they already had my pieces on set and I remix, you know, I don't make pieces for men. So I remix my female pieces to be masculine. And so Beyonce already had the female version. And so they were like, you know, we already have your pieces on set. It was a different stylist. Like, dang, I could have been I would love to see Jay-Z with some (laughs) um, whimsical jewelry on. That'd be amazing. But that, yeah, I'm yeah. That attention then brought you to this moment that you're at now, which I think is a beautiful testament to going from, you know, a small making everything by hand to something that's being mass produced and people have access to it and you're not um, restricted by your own labor capacity. You now have a partnership with Icons of Style. I'm sorry, I didn't read that before. I, I That is correct, right? I said it right. I know it's some yes, icon. Icons of style. You have apparently you have three collections coming out. Yes. And again, similar to what you said, you stayed very true to your design, to your roots. I don't see in terms of the design and 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 the feeling and the 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 energy of your brand seems to be remain intact and now everybody I see white girls with the little glass ear the um make the vases yeah. I just see everybody rocking this jewelry and that's just amazing really amazing and I guess my final question um is what does it feel like to be on the other side we all have especially as as creatives as jewel as retail people we all have like this idea of like okay i made it okay first of all you have beyonce now you have like this mass production of your work on a major respectable mm. market you get in your coins inshallah god willing what what does that feel <laughs> like um it feels like comfort um it feels like it feels like comfort in a sense of when you say getting your coin. <laughs> but when it comes to um, actually having like um, what people deem as success, it feels like pressure. Mm-hmm. Because before I didn't have pressure. I was just dancing and listening to Shade and when Kanye was crazy. And I was making music. And I mean, make, yeah, making music was the wire. And then, um, and then I had a deep experience. And then everything shifted, and then it got picked up by the biggest names in the world. And then I was like, this is an expectation. Mm-hmm. So it came with a lot of spiritual grounding, re, like just re, re-grounding and, um, and, um, and planning what I actually want for myself, what's success for me, what's a good state taste for me to be moving at, um, identifying who... I am against other businesses, um, realizing that I'm not, like, like I might not want a typical business structure or um, timeline. And so it came with a lot of re, uh, well, that's what I thought, a lot of um, a new birth, I would say, especially because this blow up happened when I was actually rooting myself in the work. Mm-hmm. So it was a big rebirth, um, both professionally and the spirit of the work. 
Can I ask you one, one, I know Shanti said that was the last question. What advice do you have for other entrepreneurs out there listening? Like I have a jewelry maker in my life who I love dearly. Shout out to Ariane's Jewelry, Angie. And I'm, and I see her growing her business and I see her doing really well. Um, and I'm just curious, like what could, what advice could you offer that person? I think the best thing for me has been that quote, be so good they can't ignore you. I feel like when people, people ask me all the time, like how did I get so-and-so or so, and, or this opportunity, they all reached out to me and I I just do my best. Mm. And so anytime I do my best, the next time my best isn't my best anymore. And so it, it turns into something else. Like first my jewelry was mostly wire and then I learned how to solder. And then I learned about casting and then I learned about clay and then I learned about wood carving. And then I was like, ooh, shoes. And so I just kept getting better and better and better. And then people saw it. So you don't need a PR. I, I mean, I don't want to say that because I might get one one day. But like when you're, when you're like, just challenge yourself. Be your own competition. Like if you're making jewelry that are leaves, you know, like, you know, next time put a little bird on it or something. You know, like just keep thinking. Like keep growing and like also start just connected, I would say connected to yourself is a big thing. Mm. Make sure it's connected to yourself and then make sure it's the truest, be the truest you can be. So when I say like be the best they, or be so good they can't ignore you, is be minute, be true, be so personal, be so epic, be so alien superstar, be so unique <laughs> that they can't because we won't be able to. Once you see something you never saw before, you'll be like, who is that? Mm. And so it's easy for everyone because we all are unique. So just be that. That I think that's what got me there. Every I, it's all attraction. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for paving the way because you truly are paving the way for black jewelry designers and putting folks on the map. And thank you for doing it in a way that is so different from what we expect of this kind of like entrepreneurial grind culture. And um, and shout out to your godmom for you. ooh, just thank paving you. the way for you yes. as well on the other side. Um, mm-hmm. Ashe to her. So yes. thank you so Ashe. much. We really, really appreciate Thank you. Thank this. Y'all. You guys, I love y'all. Thank you, you can find Ari's amazing work um, at on Macy's.com, Style Icons. Mm-hmm. When's your next collection dropping? If the next one is dropping in October. Oh, right. mm-hmm. I think it'll be around the 22nd. Get your points yeah. together. Get your early Christmas yeah. gifts. And also, you can just go to her website as well. And yeah, maybe you should do the honor of sharing where people can find you. Oh, yes. So my website is home by Ariel. Ariel is a Hebrew spelling. So here it is. A-R-E-E-A-Y-L. Home by Ariel. And that's across all social media platforms as well. And if you haven't heard the name, it's because it's new. And you may have heard B by Ari, which is the old name. So, yeah. Very (laughs) good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ari. Thank you. All right. All right. That was just very lovely. Shout out to her. Shout out to Philly. Shout out to Kappa's finest Ooh. showing up in his motherfucking world. Shining, shimmering. Shine, 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 shine. I'm telling you, Kappa really has made a deep yes. dent in the world, in the globe. Yes. Voice to men. Quest fucking, love. Philadelphia, Broad Street, gang, gang. Jasmine Sullivan, Christian That's McBride. Ridiculous. I forget his last name. Joey DeFrancesco. Who else? And that's just the music. Not to speak of the artsy people that I, I should know. know that I don't can't name. <laughs> Baby, I was about going to try. Oh, Bilal. Who else? That's another thing. Oh, singer. that's my boo. Bilal. Anyway, go ahead, Queen. Pop culture. Oh, this is mine. Pop culture. Ciao. Speaking of music, <laughs> Diddy, Diddy is, he's also on my nerves, but Diddy and Jermaine Dupri have agreed apparently to go head to head. Unfortunately, it will not be for verses because Swiss Beats and Timberland are suing Triller. 
because their Triller is not paying them. Wow. And I'm confused because I thought they own Versus. So anyway. Well, some white person owns everything, Antoinette. That's upsetting me. Not that's, learned? that's deeply upsetting me. But basically, uh, Diddy was like, since we're not fucking with Versus no more because they fucked around with our boys, meaning Swizz and Timbo, we don't need to be going against each other. Let's come together and do that bad boy so, so deaf in Atlanta, which is like uneven playing field. Diddy, why would you go to Atlanta? But he said, again, it's not a versus. He said, it's not a versus. It's just hit for hit. And then J- JD was like, let's do it. I'm sure he did say I like they just it. have to say it's not a versus for legal. They're like, they well, they're saying they're not. They're <laughs> absolutely going to but be But this gay. ain't versus, though. But they're also going to be battling people. I think it was really interesting how many people are like, JD's going to wash Diddy. That's shocking to me. But I'm also like, JD is not a slouch. I mean, he he got some people, right? But like, I don't know. Maybe it's the East Coast in me, I in don't, us. Yeah, that's what I was like, thinking. I don't feel so connected to the so-so deaf. Uh, rain as I do as bad boy. Oh, oh my god! I, I, feel like I wanted to be a part of bad boy growing up. Like I thought that that was the coolest shit ever. Like to me, Puffy was God. No. Like I, I just thought he. It, it didn't get any better. Even even Rockefeller, as great as Rockefeller is, was not is. Well, kind of. As great, excuse me, what's that? <laughs> Somebody was racing on a residential street and went through a stop sign. Oh, well, they didn't have the flashiness, you know, like the just body. Like the energy, yeah. The energy, the swag of what Puffy brought from every, from even like total. Even the grit. The grit. You got Kim, Total, Mayor, like, yeah. it It was wild times. Biggie. And then you had the death of Biggie that really made you like, oh, man, bad boy for life. And then you got Faith singing about Carl Thomas. I just think that uh, Jermaine Dupri has a longer reign. Like, Puffy had his moment, and then it kind of, like, fell f- went south a little bit in the ways that he had artists that somehow just kept they kept coming up short in a way, whereas JD may have had a more stronger, you know, less flamboyant, but a stronger range. I mean, because he even worked with the, the folks that he has silently. That's another thing. Puffy's flamboyant about who... Puffy gonna be on that fucking track. But, but JD yeah. has worked with people, and you don't know that but it's Usher's JD. But not a part of So So Deaf. But I think it's more of who they work. Like, maybe it's who he worked with. If it's who he touched and influenced. The Bow Wow, Bone Crusher. Okay, Anthony Hamilton, I forgot about. Not Anthony Ham. Not him. I hope he wasn't a sway for you. <laughs> I like Anthony Charlie. Hamilton. Whatever. Um, Escape. A jag- Jagged Edge. Okay. I just... I it's think it's not who, he, given... who he worked with is what... But That's my thing is, is it who he worked with or is it so, so deaf signed artists? I don't know. That's, Listen, that's, we gotta get that's different. Because if, if JD can just talk about who he worked with, yeah, like he's got crazy. He got I just want to say something. On the behalf of Mace, I don't want <laughs> you and Mace. Daddy to be talking <laughs> about fairness, equality, and support and brothers, okay? It seems a little shot. bit lopsided and not well, fair. It's let's not a... In, let's get into Puffy, because Puff, Puff, Puff is doing this new campaign. Love, Diddy, P. Diddy, is doing this new fucking campaign, R&B is dead. And the reason why he's doing it is because he has a project coming out where he's supposed, supposedly reviving R&B. Ciao. And he got, you know, this song with Bryson Tiller, who everybody's like, that shit slap. I think it's not very good, but I'll shut up. Um, we know somebody that's going to be on that album, I believe. Um, and it's just like, Diddy, I get the campaign. But shut, shut up. You get on my nerves. And, and 
R and B. How is R and B dead? It's not dead. It, it's shifting into some shit that I don't completely love. But there are definitely people still singing R and B. And he's like, "Who kills R and B?" And I loved whoever it was that tweeted like, "You who was fucking who was." Having people sign all these terrible ass contracts. Nigga. You killed it. You killed it. <sighs> what a trick. No. Just dancing around the stage, carrying on. That's just my boy. I don't know. That yeah, I don't diving, know. Little dubious little He really little, is. Little, what's that nigga name with the thread and the need a little leprechaun? I don't know. Ruffle still skin. Oh. He'll just be doing a little devious shit, making people Pray to give him the firstborn child, and then yeah, like oh, 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 I, I also feel years. like Puff. Sorry. No, I I just feel like Puff. Um, he was once like a master kind of uh, media manipulator, a kind of brand uh, builder, and now it's just falling short. He feels a little bit out of touch and it feels a little forced and people are kind of on to him. So it's not landing as much. And so I don't know. He had this whole live where even Mary was on it. He was on with Timberland. Missy was all in the comments where he was like, I mean, R and B is dead. R and B is dead. Who's who's out here singing R and B? And Missy was like Jasmine Sullivan. <laughs> like she kept typing it, Jasmine Sullivan. And and uh, mad people were like, uh, Jasmine Sullivan just won a won a Grammy. Like well, who else is though? Just to play a double. Well, they were saying Jasmine Sullivan. Jasmine Sullivan. They were saying Chris Brown still is. I don't know these kids' names. Chris they were Brown. still saying su- no. He Chris Brown R&B. can sing. Chris Brown can sing. I, he wants to bring back like the 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 stacked um, backgrounds, like the bridge, the yeah. men's crying in the rain i get it chris brown just did a song with tank that is very similar to that but nobody's listening to it because i I also think music today the way that it comes out you don't sit with a record anymore like we used to actually physically sit with a cd we used to sit by the radio and and record (laughs) in the back of our day I, no, I'm really serious. Now it comes out and you've got 17 to 20 tracks and you take it in and then you move on. It's like Kendrick's album was incredible. Are we still listening to it? Well, you can't. That's different. That album doesn't feel like something you can bop to. I think people, I understand Beyonce's that. album is... Well, Beyonce, Beyonce does not count in any of this because Beyonce is a part of the Illuminati and she's controlling our Jesus. brains cells in our bodies but i'm just saying like there are records that we we just take a listen we're like oh that was dope and then we move on for some sad reason and i'm like i don't know why we're doing it maybe i i still sit sit with with albums i don't sit there i can't the last album that i sat with for real for real like current was Sabrina Claudio's, and that wasn't even her last one. It was like her first one. That is, I don't even know who that is. You don't know? Oh, I gotta send you her Uh first. I think it was her first album. It's so good. The one with um, Frozen. I think it's Frozen. Bitch, I don't even know what I'm talking. But I, I just don't. I don't. I listen to playlists. I listen to a track. Like I'm not invested, invested in the way that I once was. And there's something to be said about streaming, and that I, I really feel that there's a correlation and it kind of breaks my heart a little bit i wonder i wonder if they do if they have um statistics of people's album streaming so i'll listen to i'll go to an album and stay with it for a minute which album album feel souls and cleo soul oh the mother one sit with that salt i sit with their album who Uh, salt s-a-u-l-t who she's a part of their album i don't know that i rock with that for a minute yeah, but then I will go back to albums that are not new albums. I will go back to the same albums. Mama's Gun. I'll go back to like the, those kind of things. I'll go back and sit with that. I'll just play. I, I don't know the last album. I mean, Jasmine, I feel like we're disqualified from talking about that because that's our friend. So, of course, I sat with that. I don't. I just don't know the last album I just played and played and played and revisit all the time. I don't know R and B is contingent on you have to listen to a whole album though. You know what I mean? Like the no, the quality of R and B 
I don't know if those correlate, but I hear you. I hear you. I, I, don't know I to a certain extent, agree with him. That type of R&B that we know that type of R&B that he's talking about yeah. is dead. Jodeci. I think is it's it better gonna... for the men more than the women. But I don't know if we're ever going to go back to that. And I don't know if we need to go back to that. I I, I missed it, but it feels like that was, it's gone. Now take. they talking about putting the standings to the side. They have no. anger albums like Summer uh. Walker where you're angry uh. or you're disaffected. Like, uh. what's her name? SZA. The, it's like a different uh. energy. It's love is the way that we are interfacing with love is young people's yes. completely different too. So like it's, that's it's the thing Bell, that should be talked it's about. It's Bell Hooks' not. worst nightmare. That's what it is. I'm dead serious. That's what it is. Like, she I talked think about that's it. that's what's at the root of what's lost in oh. R&Bs. We're not Agreed. talking love in the same way. Agreed. I have a hot take. My sister actually said this, and she was like, we were, we were kind of having, like, hypothesis around what these other acts from Beyonce are going to be. And my sister was like, I think she, like, what else she's going to revive? Because this is the Renaissance and this is Act One. And obviously she's reviving, you know, House. And she was like, I think that she's going to give us a really old school traditional R&B record. Hmm. And I would love that. Hmm. I would love that. I would especially love it as Destiny Child was included. And we just heard those vocal stacks. Because there is a clip going around of Kelly Rowland. On The Voice. Oh, we also should have plugged this. The Jasmine will be on this season of The Voice as John, Legend. John Legend's, one of his, uh, I don't know, vocal coaches Trainer, or whatever. Trainer, which mentor. I actually think it's going to be, I can't wait to see what this bitch says to oh. these people. She's going to be like, yeah, that was, I mean, yeah. Like, you don't have to do all the runs. Like, just, you could just, yeah, it's more about <laughs> tone and feeling. Like, yeah, but you sound great. I could just, I, I'm sure, I actually think she's going to be incredibly poignant but i just i never hear her talk like that about music really because she she just doesn't talk like that around us she's like oh no i like the album like she texted me it was like beyonce's album is incredible i'm just getting into it amazing that's all she didn't break down i went in like wrote a dissertation that shit said scene so <laughs> i'm just so curious to see like how she talks about process anyway there's a clip of kelly Rowland being jennifer hudson's like vocal coach and Je and Sh Kelly is trying to explain p to people how to blend their voices when they're singing together. And so she's like, go ahead, just sing some, anything. And she's, and so she's talking about how in Destiny's Child, whenever anybody was singing, she would immediately find a harmony, a hop on it and blend to whatever they were doing. And so he just starts singing and she does it the way she slides into this harmony and stays on her note. It's as if they're one voice. And Wait, I who said, is she singing with? Jennifer with, Hudson? With one of the, no, one of the contestants. She's oh, okay, showing okay, the, okay, okay. So okay, she doesn't okay. know this person. She doesn't really know their voice that well. And she blends with them so beautifully. I think it's on, um, what is it? They have range. And shout out to that person. I forget his name right now. That person is also a Philly native. So shout out to you know who you are. What a great IG page that you've curated. I would love to hear like those school. stacks, mm -hmm. you know, like I was listening to, um, I don't really want to stay. Mm -hmm. I really... And I, I mean, I was enthralled the other night, mm -hmm. just playing, can we get it together? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I was listening to, um, like summer rain from Carl Thomas. Oh, I was like, oh listen Maybe to the this. Maybe the physicality of the producers is different now. Like it they could don't have be. the same arrangers. It could Anymore. be arrangers, Joe, composers, uh, uh, producers. Yeah, I mean, I also, and, and we can get off of this. I, I, I just think, I think that Be it's partly Beyonce's fault. <gasps> I said it. I, she started singing so fucking fast, and everybody wanted the flow. Yeah, I don't I'm know telling. I don't think it was her. Be before Beyonce. Before Beyonce, she was the first person to hop on that track on that fucking no, no, no remix and start singing real fucking fast. And she had this like, da -da 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 -da. and everybody wanted to do it. Everybody started to mimic that eventually. And now there now a whole bunch of singers. And I hate to admit this, but Nicki Minaj was like, why are these people who can sing 
so well rapping. Like, sing, y'all. We want to hear y'all sing. And y'all hopping on a track with this flow. It's cute. She said that. Yeah, she said she did. She was like, it's cute. But like, I I miss people singing on track. So I don't know. Maybe I just fucking validated Diddy. Ugh, I hate it here. I think I think it's different. Dead. It's different. Not dead. dead. And maybe the old style of R&B is dead. That that the 90s early 2000s yes it is dead. But now you got this new alternative R&B that got everybody in a chokehold. Mm, I hated it's it. Alternative you, R&B. I do not like it. It just feels like a a stream of conscious instead of like a arc, like a story. <laughs> we won't talk about this any further, but I think the person that fucked it all up was Frank Ocean. I think Frank Ocean's writing style and the way that he helped hearken in and give people the oh writing the definitely ability to like have that flow on tracks where you're not necessarily singing, but the way that he writes. Oh and yeah, those his, are two the, different his things. Flow on on songs is just like nobody can do it as good as him. But that's what all these kids, SZA, all these. People have this Sizzle like flow is is good. It's Sizzle really good as well. She does, but it I don't well. like. I don't. I don't want to listen to it. It doesn't stay with me. It's the alternative R and B kids. All right. Well, shout out to what is generation is this? Not sure. Generation well, the one after us. <laughs> I don't even know what generation What's we are. Jojo's are we generation? Generation Alpha. Joe. What isn't it X? No. Z Z. I don't know. Well, I want to know what generate Jojo. Jo- jo- anyway, we digress. Anyway, quiet oh. quitting. Well, I'm actually going to go into this one because it's a good segue. It actually gets worse in the music scene. Oh, we God. have been notified by the interwebs, uh, most notably, what's that nigga's name? Um... Oh God! What is his name? Who's so he has Talib Kweli, who seems to be the most upset by this, which <laughs> makes me chuckle. Is that there's a new virtual rapper out here, and he's an actually an AI rapper that bars have been created through algorithms. I don't know. Some white tech guys have figured out a way to hack the habits, the subject matter, the flow styles of some of the most popular rappers out there. Again, it's the, it's not like they're going back into the early makings of hip hop, the eighties, the nineties, they're going by what's the most popular sound these days and using that to generate this AI character. Who no. has green locks? He looks like a monster, and a lot of these young rappers do a little bit. So I'm not surprised. He has green eyes, brown skin. He's a little racially ambiguous. Forehead tats. He just looks like a monster. A he has arm. grills. But that's not true. What you said. There's a black rapper who's rapping. His it's stuff. his voice that they use. Yeah, it's, and he's not credited. He he laid the bars down, and then the white person took it and made a virtual rapper, he and then wrote, never paid. He wrote the bars, or he he he. They used his. He voice. wrote them. He said that. So I when well, see the thing is, Bandy played a clip of this man. I forget his name. God bless him. Of him talking about his experience, he was like, "Yeah, I, like they they just dropped me. They fell off the face of the earth after I." recorded all this shit and then all of a sudden it's for he was i knew that it was for some virtual shit i thought it was gonna be like some new age shit but i didn't know it was like this white guy behind it like all this other stuff i just i don't know i thought the bars and the subject matter and everything they may have used a human voice they may have given him no they may have no they may have given him like some uh boundaries in terms of mm. what he could rap about and some some rapping points <laughs> rapping points but no it's him it's him he's an artist and it's him <laughs> I, well I, I also heard that the reasoning behind this was that record labels often spend a lot of time on rapper development and like trying to find the 
the artist that resonates with the people that will be, you know, get them the most money. And so they like cut through it to find like, these are the key things that resonate with people. So let's make this AI person that we know is going to slap. And it did not. It slapped them in their white faces. It's virtual blackface. That's what it is. Ah. That's what Tyler Kweli said. That's what Tyler, listen, Tyler, he said virtual blackface is (laughs) Indeed, a thing. I said, I live. You better free the people. Bad. Giving ho tip. I I don't know what kind of world we live in that we need to have virtual rap. I don't know why we're so afraid of reality. I also don't know why we would have a virtual rapper who is ba- who is in blackface, basically because it's a white person behind it getting all of the money for this, while this black man. <laughs> Is actually artists behind it. It's wild. It's like you really, what you really took on this person's likeness and made a fake. Ca- you'd rather pay a fake character and funnel money like to this boy. white person. No, but he doesn't look. But culturally, the cultural identity behind it, and Capitol Records um, said, "Oh, we've se- they've severed ties already with this virtual artist and the white man." I wish I had a statement. I couldn't find it. He went the fuck off. And he said, we offer, or Capitol Records said, we offer our deepest apologies to the Black community for our insensitivity in signing this project without asking enough questions about equity and the creative process behind it. Boy, y'all, I want to see that executive There's no Black people in these rooms. (laughs) Who, and if he was... You're going to hell. (laughs) Who was there like, yeah, man, this is hot. This is great. This is wonderful. Make his hair green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Make he's he sound just like a I don't know. We're fucked up though. Like this virtual world, social media, remote work, dating apps, the metaverse, like reality has gotten to the point where it's the lines are blurred. It's either the lines are blurred or we want them to blur because our actual realities are too hard to deal with that we have to escape into a virtual world. Not you explaining the premise of the Matrix? No. Oh my God. I'm <laughs> serious. And I have a, another, uh, I have to say, I've only seen the first Matrix and I only saw it once and I don't really remember it. So I need to watch it again. Well, Tricky. Gonna fuck you up. I then. bet. Don't you be pop upset. a gummy. Oh my God. <laughs> I recommend you pop a gummy and you sit down Go and back. watch The Matrix. You're going to be like, Shanti, the the flood. Be real? Is this real? No. <laughs> they don't want us to be real. They really don't. They'd rather us create false identities in a world that doesn't exist. We're already doing that on social media with this whole, you are your brand. Everybody's curating a fucking brand. Everybody, if I see another reel of somebody's everyday fucking life, I'm like, what is wrong with y'all? You and your spouse really woke up and set up tripods everywhere to catch these different angles of y'all doing regular shit? Like, you have to think about the actual production of it. It might be entertaining, but, like, are you present in any one of these moments? It's... We're we're not okay. We're not well. I don't know. Speaking of exploitation and the misuse of labor, y'all want to oh. talk about capitalism. But when we really get into capitalism and we really That's start cracking on this outline, you so annoying. Everybody Go is going to be like, oh, everything goes back to this. We thought it was racism. We thought it was patriarchy. But also, you're gonna be like, oh. Anyway, the whites are quiet quitting. TikTok is going crazy with this idea of quiet quitting. From the Washington Post, it writes, the term is a bit of a misnomer because (laughs) quiet quitters aren't walking away from their jobs. Instead, they're renouncing hustle culture, quitting the idea of going above and beyond at work. The trend is resonating strongly with those Generation Z and millennial knowledge workers fighting to rewrite the rules of the workplace. So they go on to, in one of these articles that I read, they go on to follow the experience of a teacher, of a elementary school teacher who was like, 
basically your contract tells you these are the amount of hours that you're supposed to work. And that's what I am sticking to. And I'm not going to go above and beyond. This is it. And ultimately, especially, I guess, I feel like a teacher is such a beautiful example. I wonder what the fuck's going on with healthcare workers because that's crazy Talk about as well. It. What happens when people stay within the means of their contract and only do the labor that they are signed on and paid to do? And what happens when people stop going above and beyond? What happens to the quality of, I mean, teachers are already in a really hard place, but I can't help but feel really sorry for the kids. I can't help but feel really sorry, again, if this permeates into healthcare. Like, this is wild. There's been some feedback from the Black folks, of course, saying that Black people, Black women do not have the luxury to do mm. this kind of slacking off because they're already heavily scrutinized and, you know... Um, watched and also assume that they're not doing the work that they should be doing anyway. So they don't even have this luxury of doing this. Uh, I mean, Antoinette, you, you'll be working girl. You just talked about staying up to two AM doing the things so you could do the things your <laughs> nine to five bleeds into your thing. creative work. Like you going to start quiet quitting. I already have. <laughs> oh, I do. I, I the, when I tell you, old me would be working even harder at this place that I work at. What I will say is that I think it would be really powerful for everyone to do this. And I understand what Black women are saying, but... I, I I don't think that we should be going above and beyond what we're paid for. I don't. I don't. You got to fucking pay me. And I don't think that it's crazy to say that in a more professional way. I think that if someone is, is if, if you're getting a performance evaluation, right? And not everybody can do this, right? But if you're getting a performance evaluation that you disagree with, I think that there's negotiation that black folks don't take advantage of. What I've realized in my time is it's one of the biggest mistakes I've made is accepting um, salaries, accepting roles without any sort of negotiation. And I'm like, every time I talk to a white counterpart about a promotion that they might be getting, a new job. They're like, oh, well, we're still in negotiations. And I'm like, the fuck are y'all negotiating? Negotiations? What they are that? negotiating their 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 rate. They're nego I know someone at my job who told them, you cannot, like, we have to have multi-factor authentication on our phones, right? So that means any, like, anytime we log into, like, part of our work database or whatever, you're going to get a ping on your phone. You have to type in a password, yada, yada, yada. We also have teams on our phone. We use our personal devices quite a bit throughout the day. A white counterpart of mine said to them, oh, this is my personal phone. If you want me to do that, then you need to supply me with a phone or pay my phone bill. Their phone bill is paid. Is my phone bill paid? No. My phone bill is not paid. So I've now looked into that of like, hi, 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 hi. What's up? The other thing that they said is you cannot contact me after 6.30. Do not call this phone past 6.30. Point blank. Period. Like they had boundaries in, in their contract. And, I'm, and I was baffled because I approached the corporate world as like, you got you to gotta fall in line. But these white folks are not doing that. So what I want to see is more black people who are... Most likely, often, the more talented, if I'm just being honest, and, and harder workers, and, and maybe a little hungrier and more creative. <laughs> but I want to see them negotiate. 
I want to see them negotiate their terms. Hi, I have a child. From this hour to this hour, I have to leave it. I know people at my job that do this. There is a woman who lives on the on on California. This is a New York-based company. She does not log into her computer until 12 p.m. Period. Our time. At the company standard is that you have to keep New York hours. She negotiated something else for herself. These are things that I would have read as like, okay, well, that's the company rule. I can't, there's no, Mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? I think, I mean, I think probably a lot of white people have access to that kind of knowledge and yield it more, but a lot of white people don't. And all, I think the idea of everybody coming together and understanding the power that you have as like this company your profits cannot be made without my labor. So like, I actually have a lot of say in the rules and what happens and what doesn't happen and how we negotiate these terms because do you need my work? Like this, is, you ain't doing me a favor. We're like in a relationship where we are, it's an exchange of labor for the things to get done. I feel like America as well over the course of whenever it all happened, but it used to be a a far more unionized workplace where Mm. it was a lot more labor before, but that people were getting exploited through the yang yang. And then niggas was like, no, we have to form labor unions that we have some power. A lot of that has changed. A lot of federal laws have made that illegal now to do, which I think is really fucked up. But I think, and I love that like, people are moving towards understanding our power as, as laborers and you, coming together to do it. I, I, I don't know. It feels divisive. I it think it's a- true. Two things can exist at once. Like, yes, black people have always been disenfranchised and not had access to knowledge, but I feel like doing it together, white, black, Puerto Rican, Haitian feels like, I think there's a a balance to be struck, though, because I do think that there are some people, especially within younger generations, who come through and there are some like, they don't want to fucking work. They just want to get paid. And there is an entitlement thing that I am seeing in younger people. They're like, well, I shouldn't have to do that. Nick, it's called work. What the fuck do you mean? Like, I don't have patience for some of that. And maybe I'm more old school, but it's like. There, yeah. there are some there cases. Are outliers. It, well, it's not just outliers. I think that there is a, there is a, it's a generational thing. Um, and we're going to get into this later when we talk about politics, because I have some mixed feelings about some things, but it, it's a generational thing of, of, there are some entitlements. And then there are some folks who we talked about this before, where like, there's these boundaries of, Everybody has to work around your boundaries, but that's not, that's not how life works either. Like not in a workplace, like there has to be some give and take and compromise. And everybody's just like hard boundary, hard this. And it's like, yo, we're on a team. Like that's, that's just not conducive. Um, So I do have, I do sometimes have to gently remind people that it is called work, but maybe I'm a bitch. I don't know. It's getting we. It's getting to be a longer episode, though. So, do you want to go through? I don't. I don't have much to say about Tyler Perry. <laughs> uh, he, he has a new movie coming out, Jazz Man's Blues. I think you should hear my hot take on this. What see the thing is, but it's given the Notebook slash Notepad because it is the same fucking movie. It's the Black Notebook, and shout out to him. But. We also found out that the lead in it is biracial. Every time you look up, you was minding your business, they're going biracial. It's getting tricky around here. So it's a biracial woman, of course, with a black man falling in love with her. Duh. Same old Hollywood story. So here we are. Um, shout out to Tyla. Uh, I, I, I actually do want to see this movie just to see the difference. In the, I want to know if it's like a carbon copy of the Notebook. And when he tweeted about it, he was like, he was like, I wrote this twenty years ago. I like, hope hey, it is. You hope it is. No, well, it's the same. God, no. I, tricky. Anyway, 
Uh, let's let's just take a quick break, pay some bills. We'll be right back right after this. And we are back. So we have two voice. Well, we have more voicemails than that, but um, we have two voicemails from one person in particular. I'm very excited to play this person's voicemail. We are going to. Um, She's going to have some anonymity because that is what she requested. So we're going to edit out her name, but yeah, here we go. Y'all, I literally have to stop my shower. Uh, my name is Chris Chiqua. I am calling. I'm currently listening to your Little White Lies episode, and I hope I get to talk to my phone guys. But well, I'm at the part where internet is talking about how she has always felt like because of her parents she had to lie to kind of protect basically to protect them because they required so much and i have never felt so seen i am currently like in therapy working on um like why i feel so comfortable to lie in my marriage um and it's things that like it's basically been like i'm living in this duality where, like, as long as I, like, although I know it's wrong, instead of me not doing it, I just know that I can just lie and cover it up and everything's okay. And I've always been this way because my parents, they just had so many, like, high expectations, and they would always tell us, like, what they expected us to do. So if it was anything that I had done that was outside of what they expected from me, I just felt like I could just lie because they didn't really seem like they really cared about the truth of the matter. It was more so the perception of it. So I'll say all that to say, I completely understand where you're coming from, Antoinette, about, you know, just not really knowing like how to stop because I mean, it's so embedded in you. And it, it does take a lot to kind of get out of that mindset where like whatever you're lying about, like, and not trying to hurt that person, like, it just, it just seems so much easier just to be like, well, whatever, whatever your lie is, and just keep it moving, because a lot of times, those people that you feel like you have to lie to do not care about the actual, like, like what's happening, it's so much, it's so big on perception, that it's like, that's the truth, it's not even a matter of, like, what you did, it's about how you how you have them looking at that point, if that makes sense. So, I don't know. I just want to say I love you guys. I love this conversation. I'm going to try and get back in the shower because I'm a single mom. I'm a mom of two twins, seven-month-olds, and it's been the first five minutes I've had two showers. So, anyways, have a good day. Bye. She called back. And I also wanted to add, um, what's interesting, too, is that me and my husband have tried the radical honesty and that was, it was fine until like when it was black and white and then like, I could kind of control the, the, the scenario. But like, um, not for my business industry, but basically like what had happened is there was something that was just completely uncontrollable, unexplainable. And I came out and I told him about what actually happened. And he was so like, it, like people always tell you like, I'm going to react a certain way. Um, my reaction would be better if you just told me this truth. And, like, his reaction was so wild that that scared me, basically, to never be able to, because it was something that I literally could not have controlled. And, you know, I was very sorry. I let him know, you know, hey, this is a, this is a mistake, whatever. And his reaction was so awful that, it made it to me. It made me feel like you know I need to just make sure. Like I'm gonna try to do my best, but also like I don't know. Like I, mean, I, don't know, I do you identify with that? Like is that is that how you feel? Like but basically like you know when people their reaction to your honesty can be so crazy. It's like I'm just gonna save us both this trouble and just go past it because either way, you know it's not worth it's not worth the drama of all of it. If that makes sense. Shanti, you're a radical honesty queen. Am I? Yeah. Um, I, I commend number one, um, 
your awareness around this and your awareness around your pattern and the source of it uh, feels like it was a survival mechanism. Mm-hmm. Um, I think because we make it's around lying. It's not around like um, maybe a sexual trauma or physical abuse kind of trauma. It feels like a less of a serious type of survival mechanism and like coping that you had to do. But I just want to let you know that it is it is just as serious. Um, and it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of grace and a lot of courage for you if and when you decide to stop lying about things to kind of reckon with reality. I think that you should also be really clear that you're not getting away with things. I think that we are energetic beings in a lot of ways. And I think that your husband probably knows it in the same way that you may recognize when truths aren't being told and the consequence you you're you're not escaping the consequence of it and that takes time to like reckon with and to realize and to choose differently and i just hope that you always realize that you can choose differently but also be very clear in your decisions that there are consequences um to it whether it be very very big or very very small And that it is very scary to tell the truth. It's very scary to to name an elephant in the room. Um, But just by you not saying it doesn't mean that the elephant isn't there. Shitting, causing a mess, wrecking shit, stinking. Like that, the elephant is still there. Whether you want to say it, whether your husband wants to do that work with you, um, that's a whole different kind of journey that you have nothing but an opportunity to take. And I, and I, and I think that you eventually will grow into it because now you, you know, you can't unknow what you know now. You can't turn back. So, yeah, continue to be courageous. And it. it takes a lot of courage and it's very scary. It's not easy. And I hope you offer yourself grace that it was learned from a very, very young age and you probably were scared in your child mind. And it takes time. Well said. I don't have anything to add to that. Um, thank you for calling us this. We have another voicemail. Hey, ma'am. Yes, hello, Shanti and Antoinette. This is AJ. Um, just calling me because I just realized what I wanted to say about the episode 190 regarding saying small. I think what Shanti was having, um, uh, it was, it was what she was trying to explain is what I think what she wants when you asked what she wanted. I think at that time when she was saying she doesn't know is that to me, I would think it means that she needs, she wants clarity as to what, to where she can begin to accept, um, where she stopped believing that she could achieve the things that she wanted to achieve and so she needed clarity and so what I think she and and what I definitely want in my life is the permission and the clarity to believe that I'm capable of doing anything I want if I if I commit myself to it and I think I don't trust myself I don't trust my instinct to change and dramatically what is that a radical uh, belief in myself um, I think that I think it's one of those things that if you've been through life and you've never really seen yourself be completely or feel completely accomplished in your life, you know, on your terms, and you don't believe that it actually exists. I don't have a family that, um, you know, pushes us to be the best or it's at the same time, they don't want us to sit around and, you know, die. They want us to engage in life. So that middle ground of having to decide when I want to participate and do things is hard when you don't trust your own instincts. A lot of people, the one thing I do respect about my best friend Jennifer is that she always has trusted her first instincts and it's because she had been violated so much as a child. Mm -hmm. And so I think that people who have been through an actual emotional, physical toil of just trying to exist, they work so hard to fight for their own self for their own relevance in, in the world. And so when you've kind of been coddled or protected so long, you kind of don't trust 
how you can handle life's difficulties on your own. And so I think that clarity is what we all need to have the bravery to actually pursue things we want in life as opposed to just settling. And so that's what I've learned from that episode, and that's why it took me a while to kind of put it into words. But I appreciate you for that episode, and I definitely want to see you guys do another full moon ritual um, because I think that you could just spend the whole episode just doing the ritual itself. And um, I think that's what Antoinette, when she saw my comment on Instagram, I think she thought, I don't know if you thought I was just insulting you guys. I was just saying that because it was 11 o'clock and y'all were saying, this is the best we could do, as, as fun as that was. And I love Shanti's uh, affirmation. I think you guys should do just the episode itself on just the um, full moon ritual. That's what I'm looking forward to. But I do love that episode. And I love y'all. Have a great uh, rest of the end of the summer. It's all- oh, damn, she got cut off. She was near the end. Sis, thank you so much. It ain't no beef over here. I was like, oh, no. I did think that but I might have been in my feelings. I do apologize. And I was like, what? She was like, girl, because y'all was, y'all was giving whack. She said something like that. It wasn't whack. It wasn't sleepy. No, it wasn't sleepy, but it started with an F. Doesn't matter. First off, do you, did she capture what you were feeling or no? I don't know if that's... Um, that, yes and no. Okay. Yes and no. I feel like that's a, a lot to go into in this moment, but, yeah. but yes and no. Yes and no. I really, um, I really appreciate this message. I love hearing from people when, and, and them telling us, you know, what they want for themselves or mm-hmm. their, how they would respond to what mm-hmm. our prompts are. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, to have the, the courage to, to radically trust yourself and believe in yourself is, that's a great one. Ciao. I think we're both trying to be that courageous at this point. I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know if either one of us have that kind of radical trust. I feel like if I did, I might quit my job or maybe that's just reckless. I can't figure the balance out, but (laughs) um, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for calling. And I, I personally loved the full moon episode. I, um, I would love to do that again. We also did, we did the... The new moon is the, the one new, that we need to do Right, next. we so need that's to do the, the one where moon. you set the intentions and you're like, boom, bang, I bang. thought that we spent a full episode on it, though. That was a full episode. We just had, like, some kiki up front, but that was a full episode. Um, but, yeah, it was late, so maybe we need to do it a little earlier. Um, oh, just so you all know, or I guess it passed. What the hell was the date? You're looking for the new moon? It was yesterday. Damn. Well, we got to get the new, new moon. It's going to be a new one soon, y'all. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much for calling. I th- I don't think we have time for the other voicemail, so I'm going to save that. But please, please reach out to us. Give us feedback. Ask us questions. Give us topic ideas. 215-948-2780. That's 215-948-2780. And before we go, baby, you knew that I was not going to let y'all get away without talking about my booty do, Joseph Robinette Biden. It's the Robinette for me. <laughs> baby, President Joe Biden announced his plan to address student loan debt forgiveness, which includes debt forgiveness, oh, student loan debt, excuse me, which includes debt forgiveness um, for certain borrowers and extending the pandemic-related payment pause. He's extending that pause to basically January 1 of 2023. That is when student loan repayment will, uh, you know, will resume. But right now, individual borrowers who make less than $125,000 yearly and married couples or heads of households who make less than $250,000 yearly will have up to $10,000 of their federal student loan debt forgiven if they did not receive a Pell Grant as an undergraduate student. Individual borrowers, same the same thing as this, for, for people who did get a Pell Grant, because I'm not reading all that, it'll double. And a Pell Grant is basically, it's a grant that is only given to undergraduate students who, quote unquote, display exceptional financial need and have not earned a bachelor's graduate or professional degree. And does not ha- it does not have to be repaid under certain circumstances. So basically, 
you have to be without much means in order to even qualify for a Pell Grant. And Pell Grants currently over only cover about a third of the cost of a four-year public college degree, which has led people who qualify for Pell Grants to have to borrow all of the rest of the money. So the thinking is, if you actually qualify for a Pell Grant, you are in greater need of, of forgiveness because most likely you've taken out more loans than the others. That's the thinking and the rationale behind it. The Biden administration is also proposing a rule to create new income-driven repayment plans. This is where borrowers would pay no more than 5% of their monthly income on undergraduate loans. This is a decrease from the current 10% threshold. I think that that is, that last part is huge. That's the part that I'm like, yes. Um, I, I was shocked at the, I'm not shocked. I was, I feel conflicted. Um, I had a conversation with a friend about this and he has very different um, viewpoints than me. But I was, I thought the response to this was uh, interesting. <laughs> Some people were joyous and other people were beyond frustrated and angry. And something that came up for me and I had to observe it and kind of check it was I was one frustrated because I paid off all my loans and I was like, damn, I would have really liked to have this 10 K, but I paid off all my loans and not because I have a whole bunch of money, but because I really hustled and I, um, sacrificed a lot in order to pay that off, lived in a one bedroom apartment with my sister and my cousin in order to pay this off and get this burden off my back while slinging plates at a jazz club for years. So I say that to say two things. And I, I went on I went on about this on See the Thing is you should listen to it because they play the clip there. But the budgetista had an incredible clip where she was talking about the difference between white and black families. And white folks, their interest they're interested in in creating wealth for themselves. And black folks' number one financial goal was to be debt free. And she went on to talk about how being debt free doesn't mean as much as you think it does. And she said, my, my nephew who's four is debt free. My nephew who's four is also broke. So what she's saying is you need to take your money and make it and, and you might have to have some debt, but you need to create wealth and then pay down that debt later as you're creating this wealth. That is not something that I did. I wish looking back, I would have taken that money, invested it in something that maybe could have created some passive income for me or even garnered some compound interest. And then I would have been able to pay this off a little differently. But that's an aside. The other thing that I felt conflicted about was how many people were angry about this. And um, I was like, okay, this is a step. I felt like it was a step in the right direction. It's going to help folks because I am of the thinking that education should be available for everyone. Um, I, it really bothers me that finances get in the way of folks' education. I went to a very expensive school in New York and almost all of the black folks that I started with, there weren't many of us, they did not graduate because they could not afford to stay in the school. And that really fucking frustrated me. I was someone who was an RA. I was a maid in school. I worked really hard. I didn't go to school right away. I did fucking city year to get grant money in order to help pay for my school. And I was also incredibly privileged because my parents happened to be divorcing around the time, that doesn't sound like a privilege, but wait for it, around the time when I was set to go to school and they both were moving in with their significant others and needed to sell their house. Therefore, they were able to help me financially with this school. Everyone paid a third of my school and what I couldn't pay, I 
and or, or what I couldn't pay in scholarships and grants, I had to take loans out, which looking back wasn't really even that much. All this to say, I have a friend who's of the mindset of like, if you say you're going to take out fucking loans and then you, you take them out and then you feel like you shouldn't have to pay it, what is the, why do you feel that entitlement that you shouldn't pay these loans back? Like the, and my thing is I hear that. I hear it. I really do. But I also, I have a deep problem with the cost of education. So I am of the mindset of like, fuck them schools, their price gouging, and let's let's do something different. I do feel like we are, we are arming this new generation or some folks with the notion of like, you should be kind of bailed out of certain situations that they shouldn't be in in the first fucking place. But my real interest is how do you get these schools to drop their prices or how do you give people money up front to help them go to schools? I just don't think this is the best solution. I do feel that people who are already riddled in debt do need relief. But my question is how, what are we doing for the people who are entering into school who are about to just garner the same amount, if not more in debt, you know, like, this is a step in the right direction, which is why I'm more interested in the borrowers having to pay no more than 5%. The, I, I dated someone, he used to pay 670 some dollars a month and he wasn't making that much fucking money, but he had to pay that shit every month. Like that shit was wild to me. And in New York, and your rent is already what? Like at least 18, $1,900 a month. It's just wild. But I've been blabbing. So go ahead, Shanti. What are your thoughts on this? Do you qualify? Do you have school loans? Damn. I wanted you to be able to get this. I hope Amanda does. I call her. Go ahead. No, I don't have any um, school loans. I, at a very young, dumb age, um, took out a loan to go to a vocational school because I'm from Philly. And what do Philly girls do? We become medical assistants. So I've been paying <laughs> that dumb ass shit back for a very long time. And I think that, that doesn't count. Oh, that doesn't I think count. it is included. It is included. I just looked it up. It is included. Um, but you know, I've already um, paid it back. Damn. I just really resent the idea that what your friend said that, you know, if you're going to pay a loan, you you take, a loan out. take a loan, take a loan out that you should pay it back. I don't think anybody, anybody went into this. I, I think the number one, the disillusion of what school means and how it can help you achieve the American dream is the first thing that. that got everybody fucked up. Mm -hmm. And not one of these kids takes these loans out and doesn't think, yeah, I'm going to be able to afford you. Yeah, this is, I'm bettering my life. I'm, right. I'm, you know, going to be able to go up a class because I'm going to college. Mm -hmm. How many kids are going to college and not knowing what the fuck they want to do mm -hmm. and wasting a lot of precious years and money and then getting shackled down by these debts is criminal. It's criminal. And these are young kids. They're 18, 19. You're like, these are the really young. 17. 17. To expect them to know to hold on to the debt and then invest that. Even that idea feels like, sure, that sounds great. But nobody know. Kids don't know. People are 40, 50, 60. We don't have the financial literacy available to us. And then it's like, oh, go get that information. Sure. But. The stress of being in survival mode. Can niggas have kids? People get sick. Like there's so many. It's nuanced. It's and so it's nuanced. And I, I really think that we are not getting a clear picture of how entrenched and how mass majority of the American population is struggling and the middle class is disappearing Dying. and no trace of it being able to like once it's becoming the rich and the poor in a lot of ways and the working we're all poor. believing that, oh, somehow I'm going to become a millionaire by whatever, by working my fucking ass off or whatever the thing we're disillusioned by going to school, by, 
I, I just think that that's the, that is symptomatic. The fact that everybody's in debt and can't really pay off these loans. And now we're being told that you're trying to get over because people are asking for relief or because they are um, believing again in this fallacy of what, what does Beyonce say? America's got a problem. This is not, it is not the same America anymore. Things are changing at a really rapid rate and like college is going to become a luxury for a lot of people and is a luxury for a lot of people and is a pipeline to being even more impoverished and not being able to like invest or free your money up in a way because you're paying back 300 is 300 dollars to some people is so much money so 300 dollars to me straight up if i get an extra 300 dollars is like cool cool wow that's something to people. And people have that off their back, like, and it only goes back into the economy, right? Like I was listening to NPR when they were talking about, and I don't understand how this connects to inflation, but the worry is that these people that are getting this extra income now, that money normally goes straight back into, the, people are buying shit with it now. You know what I mean? We're not using it to invest. We're not using it to put it in savings. This is income that people need that, I don't know, I I just, I kind of resent that idea and it sounds really symptomatic of pull yourself by the bootstraps. Like poor people are poor because they bad, have bad character and they make poor decisions. Yes, yeah, and it wasn't and that, it wasn't that. It was, th they were arguing the same exact argument of like, college is not necessary college is like a joke like people are buying into this joke they were also arguing that like I, they came up with very very impoverished people who figured out a way for their kids to go to school and all this stuff it, it, i i i don't want to speak for that person but i i understood where they were coming from i still didn't agree with them but my concern i, I do understand the frustration around hearing people pissed off that, you know, people writing like you, like I, I'm waiting for all my debt to be cleared, you know, Joe and adding him and tearing him up. And it was like, Oh, you just got 10,000 free dollars. Like, I don't know where there's no gratitude in that. And I understand he campaigned on certain things and you got Bernie Sanders putting the, bur the battery on folks's back. And then there's the comparison of like, Hey, you were able to free up all this money for PPP loans, which is, and this college thing that you're doing is a fraction of that. You're able to send oh, all this military. money over to you, Ukraine, yeah. right. But the military and things like, that's what actually keeps this country running is the fact that our military is as strong as it is. And sick, the economy is as strong as it is. And this country is running because people are poor and people are rich. So it's, it's a, it's so fucking complicated. So I, I don't know if people, I, I am from a place of privilege where I can sit there and say like, oh, it, it bothered me a little bit that people were mad about it being, to get in 10K. Fuck, I want 10K. I was happy for them. And then to see that how frustrated folks were and like pissed, it did feel like, wait a minute. But then I had to check myself and say, well, if I was in a position where I literally could not function i couldn't survive paying this shit trying to make these loan payments i don't know i'd be pissed too you know I, I i see i try to see both sides and i i really don't know the solution but i hope that you know i want to remind folks that joe has said that this is one of many steps that he's trying to take i know that he has to play a lot of politics with congress and everything the fuck else midterms are coming up and he's only two not even is he two years in yeah he's two years in almost two years he got he's got more time left on his term let's see what the fuck happens let's see what gets done you can't change everything in you know less than two years so it's a step i will say a glimmer of hope hopefully no, not just for lives for have folks. been changed by yes 
and also some a people, lot of compassion to people is like that is not a fucking yes drop in the bucket there Fuck it you. is duality is a thing. Still exactly exactly so that's it for this episode Woo! we made it girl it's a long one so uh yeah we will be back next week with another episode of Around the Way Curls. With that, we are out.